namaste. So I hesitated to make this video for some time because I didn't want to contribute to all the hype. If you look around on YouTube, there's 150 videos about the upcoming solar eclipse. And most of them are making mundane astrological predictions of gloom and doom and hyping the thing to the max, you know, using it to predict the uh, death or assassination of whoever they don't like. <laughs> I couldn't just sit on the sidelines. I had to say something to counteract all this hype. So this video is in two parts. In the first part, we'll go over the celestial mechanics of the upcoming eclipse. And in the second part, we'll try to come up with a reasonable prediction for what's going to happen on and after the March 29th solar eclipse. Here's the top-down global view of the eclipse area. And you can see it's centered with the maximum totality in British Columbia, but it spreads across Greenland to the northernmost shores of the USSR, or Russia, whatever we call it these days, and even as far as Scandinavia and the UK. Whereas in the south, the outermost reaches of visibility of the eclipse actually barely touches Washington and New York City. Here's another view of the same thing in Mercator projection. And it's showing the maximum intensity or maximum visibility of the eclipse quite clearly. Now, this animation shows how the visibility cone develops as the night moves westward over to Asia the dawn in the East Coast U.S. brings the beginning of the eclipse, and then it spreads upward and even touches parts of Europe and Africa. This animation shows the transits or the movements of the planets in the sky leading up to the present situation where we have six planets in Pisces opposing K2. So as you can see, the moon is going around and making all these aspects with the different signs, whereas on the left upper quadrant, all the planets are slowly moving into Pisces. Here's where we are right now. This is the lunar eclipse that is happening on Friday, the 14th of March. It's a total lunar eclipse only visible in the Western Hemisphere. And this is not really such a powerful eclipse, but it sets up the situation for the next eclipse, the solar eclipse on March 29th, which is very powerful and going to be an incisive event that will determine the course of at least the next couple of years. This is how the solar eclipse looks on the transit map. Now let's take a look at the actual astrological charts of the moment of the eclipse. These are very revealing. One way to look at astrology conceptually is as 12 houses arranged around a square. And then there are these different characters, the planets, who move around from house to house. And when they gather in one house, there are interactions between them, sometimes friendly, sometimes conflict. And, well, it's so complicated that no human mind can actually grasp the totality of the possibilities of these interactions. So here we have a very interesting gathering of six planets in the house of Pisces. Pisces in the natural zodiac is the 12th house, the house of death, losses, and also enlightenment. And these six planets are having a powwow. 
Saturn is waiting just outside the door, only two minutes away. And he is about to join the party right in the midst of the solar eclipse. First of all, let's analyze the aspects. In Western astrology, they're called aspects. But in Vedic astrology, in Jyotish, they're called drishti. Drishti means looking. And they're not always exactly like the Western aspects. So analyzing the drishti, the six planets in Pisces are all looking at K2, seven bhavas or houses away. So they have a seven bhavas drishti to K2. Jupiter in Cancer has a five bhavas drishti to K2. Mars in Gemini has a four bhavas drishti to K2. All eyes of all the planets are on K2. That's what I meant when I said K2 has the ball. You can analyze, and maybe Saturn is a significator in the classical analysis, or maybe the sun is, but all of them are looking at K2 to provide the meaning to this intense situation. Now, this chart shows what happens just six hours after the peak of the eclipse. While it's still going on, Saturn enters Pisces. It's like the five other planets, Moon, Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Rahu, are having a party or having a meeting, and Saturn walks into the room. Boom. So Saturn is going to say, all right, you guys, you know how Saturn is. All right, you guys, this is what we're going to do. Because Saturn, Shani is one of the names of Shiva. He has the power to significate the entire stellium. And where is he looking? Right at K2, like everybody else. Now, this chart shows the situation only two hours later, or eight hours after the peak of the eclipse, where the ascendant, the lagna, moves to Virgo, right on top of K2. Virgo is the sixth Rashi, the sixth natural house of the zodiac, and it becomes the first bhava, the moment of sunrise, at least in the UK. So this is the moment when, if something is going to happen, it's going to happen at this moment. This is the moment when all the decisions looking to K2 are going to be resolved, and the meaning is going to be ascertained. Now, it might not result in an immediate effect, an immediate phenomenon, but it certainly will crystallize the stellium and create the mood or the decision going forward. And now in the next part of the video, we'll go over what this could possibly mean. The problem with analyzing the meaning of K2 in this situation particularly, but even in general, is that K2 can mean so many things. In general, K2 scatters and disintegrates and takes things away. That can be good or bad, depending on the context. Let's look at some of the meanings of K2, given in the astrological literature. In general, K2 moves in scattered directions, and this is a forecast during any period controlled by K2. So what could this mean? Well, it could mean this, or this, or this, or even this. It could mean any or even all of those things, because the point is, there is no one meaning to K2. So all the astrologers who are predicting this is what's going to happen on the 29th of March aren't getting it. The whole point is you can't predict what K2 is going to do. K2 
K2 is crazy. K2 is mad. He's a demon. So he's going to destroy stuff. We know that. But there is no telling for sure what he's going to destroy or how he's going to do it. There are so many possibilities because all six major planets are there in Pisces looking at K2 saying, OK, it's up to you. So he can use their powers in any way that he wants. And what he wants is usually pretty weird. I don't think it's possible for a human being to decipher this situation and come up with a single definitive interpretation. So we have to be satisfied with a general meaning. And what is that? Well, let's look into how often do we find all six major planets in one sign. It's pretty rare. It happens only about once in a century, only 25 times in the last 2,025 years. And only two of those were in Pisces in 1615 and 1113. But if we take the moon out of the equation, because the moon is the fastest moving planet and leaves the stellium first before any of the others, the only event that matches is on April 4th, 1968. And of course, that was the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the famous civil rights leader who broke the back of race discrimination in America. No good deed goes unpunished. That's the Murphy's Law version of justice in this world. So what are we going to see on April 29th? Maybe another assassination? Or maybe it's going to be a big storm? Or maybe an earthquake? Or it could be some kind of war event? Maybe a major attack in Ukraine? Or maybe a new war starting? It's impossible to say. It could be a stock market crash. It could be actually all of those things. We don't really know. What we do know is that it's going to be big, big news on the scale of COVID or maybe even bigger. And it's going to affect the whole world, all the planets, and all the things they represent for the next two and a half years. Because the significator, the decider, Saturn, will stay in Pisces for that length of time. This is going to be an era, just like we remember the COVID era, which lasted about the same length of time, because again, it was a movement of Saturn. Saturn is the one who imposes discipline. So in this case, Saturn is deferring his judgment of what's going to happen to K2, which is sort of like throwing the dice and saying, well, whatever, man. <laughs> the time has come for the imposition of discipline on the human race, on this planet. This is because of our mistakes, our excesses, our misjudgments are stupidly renouncing our connection with God and nature and believing in material science, which has led us totally astray. So this is karma. That's why Saturn is involved. That's why all the planets are following Saturn's lead and looking at K2 and saying, look, however you want to do it, man, it's cool. And that seems to indicate a very widespread effect that's going to affect a lot of different areas of life for a significant period of time. But exactly what it is, no one can say. Man proposes, but God disposes. 
If you want a reading, get in touch with us on WhatsApp and we'll see how this planetary stellium might affect you. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya.